Good morning. Um, our panel is here to discuss uh, for the next 45 minutes the uh, coming developments in health IT. But before I start, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, Sarah Gerke. She's the Research Fellow in Medicine, Artificial Intelligence, and Law at the Petri Flom Center and the driving engine behind the Center's project on precision medicine, artificial intelligence, and the law. Our second speaker is Adam Landman, who is the Chief Information Officer at Brigham and Women's Hospital and also the leader, really, at Partners, I think, in artificial intelligence and in moving, uh, moving things forward in this uh, very changing world. So thank you. And so what's on our agenda today? Well, it's health information technology, or health IT, often refers to the electronic <laughs> systems healthcare professionals use to share, store, or analyze health information. Thus, the collection of data, data sharing, the patient experience, patient access to data, and data privacy play here an essential role. Moreover, th through the massive pool of data and the growth in computation power and more sophisticated algorithms, AI and machine learning is changing medicine. But with this change, it's also essential that we look at liability in case something goes wrong, safety of products. And Sarah and Adam will discuss some of these important issues raised by Health IT in the next 25 minutes. And we will then have 15 minutes left for discussion and questions from the audience. So I turn this over to Adam, I believe. Thank Great. you. Thank you for the uh, really nice introduction, Rena, And thank you all for the opportunity to um, talk with you this morning. Um, what I, what I, while we're going to talk about technology and, and AI, I always like to set the stage that what we're really talking about is healthcare. And the true opportunity in healthcare right now, I think, is well captured by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim, uh, combined with one additional aim that was recently added by the American Medical Association. If you're not familiar with the IHI's triple aim, it's, it's we're seeking to improve overall population health. Um, improving the experience of care, so the safety um, and the impact of care, and the efficiency of care, the, or the cost of care. Um, but at the same time, we also need to pay attention to our clinician experience. Often we make changes to healthcare, such as introducing technology, and we find that it increases administrative burden for our clinicians and for our, um, for our patients. And so what we're really looking for um, as we're talking, we're looking for solutions that address all four of these aims. There's not a single panacea for this, but I think artificial intelligence and machine learning um, really has an opportunity to make substantial improvements to address the quadruple aim. Um, just quickly, I uh, just want to define machine learning as we're going to be talking quite a bit about it. Machine learning is, uh, by one definition, and this is from Zach Kahani, who's chair of um, biomedical informatics at, at Harvard, and he's defining it as a program that learns to perform a task or to make a decision automatically based on data. And that's really in comparison to tasks that might be um, programmed explicitly um, uh, on a computer. And what I really like in, in Zach's article is he puts up a really nice continuum of machine learning, starting from um, you know, algorithms that are fully human guided to algorithms at the top that are really fully machine guided. And so if you think um, in the bottom left, if you can see the, the black circle number 22, those are largely human guided. And examples there might be simple heuristics. So I'm an emergency physician, and you know, I often use simple heuristics to determine um, where do I admit someone if they need to be admitted to the hospital? How do I determine if they go to the intensive care unit or to a monitored bed or to a non-monitored bed? And I often use things like my clinical judgment, my experience. I might look at their vital signs. I might just think about how previous patients with that condition have done. So I, I use heuristics as opposed to um, something that's maybe one step up the red circles, um, regression analysis, oftentimes we will do um, regression or, or, or use um, commonly um, accepted statistical methods um, to calculate risk scores. And there's some human element in that in the sense of we look at the variables that are being considered for these models and we will use our clinical um, judgment to determine which variables we think um, are applicable to include in a model. And then we'll let the computer through the regression analysis figure out how they're related and potential other, um, other variables. And so regression analysis is one step up um, in, this, um, in this spectrum um, heading towards machine guided. 
And sort of at the very top, around um, the second row, is convol con um, convolutional neural networks. Um, and these are really where we're allowing the machine, the, alg the machine, to explore the data and produce the algorithm on its own without human input. And I want to just briefly share two examples. The first is for diabetic retinopathy. This is a complication that um, diabetics can have that can lead to vision loss. Um, so it's a very significant um, side effect. And recently, researchers um, from Google um, reported a deep learning algorithm that could interpret and actually um, look at images. This is a, a, these are images, photographic images of a patient's retina. And the left side shows a normal retina. The right side shows um, a retina that has evidence of diabetic retinopathy. And essentially, they took a data set that was labeled by ophthalmologists, so a large data set, some healthy, and some showing signs of diabetic retinopathy. And and they fed that into a deep learning algorithm. And what the results that are being shown here are, val are validation sets. So after the algorithm was produced, we then ran it against another library of known healthy and known diseased. And the algorithm performed really, really well. It had a sensitivity of around 96% and a specificity of around 94%. Sensitive, highly sensitive tests are great for ruling things out. Um, so in other words, um, this has high sensitivity. If you use this algorithm, you can be pretty sure that the patient doesn't have diabetic retinopathy if this algorithm says that they don't have it. One other cool example that came out last week is a study um, that used video. Um, and from taking a video of patients um, could identify if the patient has atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a cardiac um, arrhythmia. Normally, the way we diagnose this is by putting on a 12-lead EKG, if you've had the stickers attached to your chest and your arms and your legs. Um, and the incredible part about this study is there was nothing attached to the patient. This is simply from video. Um, and so the, you're seeing the actual rhythms in the background here. When they did the study, the rhythms were not available um, to the algorithm. The algorithm is only based on video. Um, that's a deep learning algorithm. And at the bottom, you're seeing the performance of this algorithm. And so what you're seeing is that for the majority, you're seeing lots of true positives. The algorithm thought there was AFib, and there was, and lots of true negatives. Um, you're not seeing very many false positives or false negatives, which is just another way of saying the algorithm has very high sensitivity and specificity. So it's really good performance. But importantly, it's not perfect. And that's the last point I wanted to end on here, which is um, this is a fundamental theorem of informatics, which is computers are not trying to replace clinicians. Um, what we're really doing with computers are algorithms and computers are going to supplement the clinicians to make the clinicians better. And it's really because these tests are not perfect, as I showed you. They're not 100% sensitive and 100% specific. Think about the atrial fibrillation case. If we're wrong and we miss a case of atrial fibrillation and there's no other intervention, then you have a patient walking around that have, has atrial fibrillation not being anticoagulated, treated with blood thinners, and has a higher risk of developing a stroke. Conversely, if we treat a patient for AFib based on an algorithm that doesn't actually have AFib, then you're giving that patient blood thinners and increasing the risk of very serious side effects. And so I want to turn it over to Sarah now, who's going to talk a little bit more about the safety um, and liability of artificial intelligence. Yeah, so this year was also a very important year for regulators and AI. So in April 2019, the FDA proposed a regulatory framework for modifications to AI ML-based software as a medical device. And software as a medical device, or SAMD, is defined by the IMDRF. And that's an international medical device regulatory forum, a voluntary group um, of medical device regulators from around the world um, to aim, um, whose aim is to accelerate international medical device regulatory harmonization. And the IMDRF uh, defines SAMD as software intended to be used for one or more medical purposes that perform these purposes without being part of a hardware medical device. And the FDA, under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, um, considers medical purpose as those purposes that are intended to treat, diagnose, cure, mitigate, or prevent disease or other condition, conditions. So in short, SAMDs um, um, is software that is on its own a medical device, but is not part of a hardware medical device. And until now, the FDA has exclusively approved or cleared um, AI, AI ML-based SAMDs um, that are locked out 
algorithms. And the FDA uh, defines a locked algorithm as an algorithm that provides the same result each time the same input is applied to it and does not change with use. So any AI ML system can actually uh, satisfy this, this definition, provided it is fixed in advance. Um, but um, the most like AI ML algorithms are adaptive, and that's arguably their key strengths. So even parameters in a simple module, like a logistic regression, will gradually evolve as a model is refit in response to new data. And so as the use of AI and ML in medicine continues to grow, regulators really face a fundamental problem. Um, so after evaluating a medical AI ML um, technology and deeming it safe and effective, the question is, should the regulator limit its authorization to own only uh, the version of the algorithm um, that was submitted, or really permit marketing of an algorithm that can adapt and continuously uh, evolve and learn to new conditions. And so for drugs and ordinary uh, medical devices, this problem typically does not arise, um, but it is this capability to continuously evolve um, which underlies much of the potential benefit of AI and ML. And so for adaptive AI ML-based um, SAMDs, the FDA, for example, proposed a total regulatory uh, life cycle regulatory approach. It's a TAPLC approach. And that permits uh, improvement of such devices while um, maintaining their safety safety and effectiveness. And the TPLC approach, FDS TPLC approach, is a feature of the software pre-certification program. And that it, um, is piloting currently on a small number of companies to um, determine its feasibility. And so one major idea of this um, discussion paper, FDS discussion paper, is that AI ML-based SAMD uh, could be updated to a certain extent after marketing authorization. So when seeking initial pre-market review um, an AI, of an AI ML-based SAMD, manufacturers would be given the option to submit also a predetermined change, uh, change control plan, which contain uh, a description on, of anticipated modifications and also an algorithm change uh, protocol, including uh, the associated methodology um, being used to implement such changes. And so in our newest paper, which was just published today in Science, um, my colleagues at INSEA, Professor Boris Babek, Professor Theodorus Evgenio, and Professor Glenn Cohen and I, we uh, to, uh, discussed the update problem and also the treatment of locked versus adaptive algorithm by building on FDA's um, a discussion paper and also on the pre-cert uh, program, which may play really an influential role in how uh, other countries will shape uh, their associated regulatory architecture. And so in our new paper, we suggest a continuous risk monitoring approach. So as regulators push forward, we think that their emphasis should be really on developing um, a process to continuously monitor, identify and manage associated risk due to AI ML features, such as concept drift, covariate shift, and instability, and less on articulating ex-ante plans for future algorithm changes. So a uh, first concept drift uh, describes a situation where there is a true, the true relationship between inputs and outputs changes, and that can be over time. So this may happen because of a changing environment or because a model was misspecified. Um, so consider, for example, an AI ML system that is trained to identify skin lesions as benign or malignant. And so the model presupposes an underlying distribution of these labels, so benign versus malignant. Um, however, the data sets often of these AI ML systems rely on typical, uh, typically do not track race or skin uh, color and so, or may miss or not report certain skin times. And yet this malignancy of skin lesions, so the true relationship between the inputs and the output diagnosis may vary across race uh, and skin type. And as a result, um, the same image can lead to two different probabilistic diagnoses. And that's depending on the underlying skin and race, and which is really an omitted feature. And second, uh, when the input distribution of new data is different from the data that the algorithm was trained or tested on for, for approval on, the result is covariate shift. And that can, for example, happen when the training data may have come from geographically centralized clinical sites 
and but the device is to be deployed beyond uh, those regions and populations. And the third very important thing is it is very important that similar patients are treated similarly. So uh, that is medically insignificant differences among patients should not lead to substantive differences so uh, in diagnosis of treatment because it's really unpleasant or undesirable to have an algorithm which is not stable and for example classifies medically similar skin lesions very differently. So to sum up, we really uh, suggest that a continuous risk monitoring approach to identify and manage risk due to AIML features such as conceptive covariate shift and instability um, can include different elements such as retesting, simulated uh, checks, adverse world stress tests, and appropriate uh, division of labor, and also the use of innovative electronic systems. Another question um, is who will be actually held liable under current law if an AI-based product harms a patient? And so my colleagues, Professor Nicholson Price and Glenn Cohen and I, we try to uh, shed some light into this darkness and examine in our new paper in JAMA uh, the potential liability for physicians using medical AI. And so in general, to avoid medical malpractice liability, physicians must provide care at the level of a competent physician within the same specialty, taking into account available uh, resources. And so the situation becomes more complicated when an AI algorithmic recommendation uh, becomes involved. So in part because AI is really very new to clinical practice and there's essentially really no case law uh, on liability involving medical AI. Um, nonetheless, it is possible uh, to understand uh, the current law, uh, how it will might, may likely be uh, treat this situation from a general, more general tort law principle. And so this chart uh, shows potential legal outcomes related to AI's, uh, AI use in clinical practice. So for example, imagine an AI uh, recommends the drug and the dosage for a patient uh, with ovarian cancer and assume that the standard of care for this patient would be to administer uh, 50 milligram per kilogram um, every three weeks for a specific uh, chemotherapeutic agent. And so if the AI recommends the stand, standard of care dosage and that standard of care is correct, but the physician rejects such recommendation, he or she will likely be held liable for injury to this patient, which is scenario two. Um, however, if the standard of care dosage, which the, the AI recommends, is incorrect, because for example, let's imagine uh, there is some reason why the higher dosage is right for this particular patient and the physician follows such recommendation, there will likely be no liability for the physician despite injury to the patient, which is scenario three. Likewise, let's imagine uh, that the AI recommends a non-standard of care dosage and the AI is correct and the standard of care is incorrect, but the physician rejects the recommendation of the AI and follows the incorrect standard of care, the physician will likely not be held liable for an injury to the patient since he or she followed the standard of care, which is scenario six. But if the physician mm, follows the AI that recommends the non-standard of care dosage and the AI is incorrect, then he or she will likely be held liable for, for harm to the patient, which is scenario C seven. So thus, tort law really typically privileges the standard of care, regardless of the effectiveness in a particular uh, case. So when physicians follow the standard of care, they will not generally be held liable for a bad outcome, even if a different cause of action would have been better for a particular patient in a particular case. So these are the yellow boxes here in this chart. Um, so thus, under current law, a physician faces liability only when he or she does not follow the standard of care and an injury results, which are the red boxes in the chart. And uh, so the safest way to use medical AI from a liability perspective is um, to use it as a confirmatory tool to support existing decision-making uh, processes rather than a source of ways to improve care. Um, but the, but we, I have to say that the standard of care is, of, um, of course, not forever fixed. And it may well be that someday 
AI becomes the standard of care. And if and when that happens, scenario six and seven, these are the italicized text here in the chart, may change substantially. So physicians may incur liability for rejecting correct but non-standard AI recommendations and may conversely avoid liability for injury if they, uh, if they were following incorrect AI recommendations. Um, but although current law uh, around phys physician liability in medical AI is, is really already very complex, the problem becomes far more complex um, uh, with the recognition that the physician liability is just really one small piece of a larger ecosystem of liability. Uh, hospital systems that purchase and implement medical AI, AI manufacturers, uh, but also potentially even payers uh, could, ha um, could um, all face liability. And moreover, the law may change so in addition to AI becoming the standard of care, which may happen through ordinary legal evolutions, so legislator could also impose very different rules. So for example, such as a uh, no-fault system, like the one uh, that currently compensates individuals uh, who have vaccine injuries. Um, but let's have a look now um, on the patient's experience, so how a patient experienced some of these issues. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start with a, with a question. Um, could you raise your hand, please, if you have been to a physical bank in the last 30 days? Oh, quite a bit. Wow. This is, uh, you know, probably 40% of the, this may represent that there's a lot of lawyers here that um, are thinking, uh, thinking about uh, liability and, and privacy. Um, for me personally, I haven't been to a bank in a long time. And usually when I ask this question in audiences, it's more like 5% of the audience that's been to a, a physical bank. And it's because of the innovation that you're seeing in the top left. Um, you can do much, much, most of your banking now in the palm of your hand on your smartphone. And as soon as smartphones started to have the ability to, cat to deposit checks, that was one of the last times I actually needed to visit a bank. And now with things like Google Pay, Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, you can actually, you don't need cash anymore. You can pay with your, with your phone. So banking has been uh, completely transformed. And now let's think about the right-hand side, healthcare. Um, when you need to make an appointment with your doctor, um, you tend to have to pick up the phone and try to call the office. And often you get redirected to three different people to try to make an appointment. Um, then uh, you actually go to your appointment, and oftentimes you're asked to sign in, write your name uh, on a piece of paper at the front desk. And then they hand you a stack of papers to fill out, asking you about your medical problems, your meds, your allergies, all information that's already in the electronic health record. Um, then you sit down, filling out dutifully filling out your stack of papers, and then they sort of open a door and yell out your name, um, inviting you back into the office. And so if you think about the experience of healthcare, um, and then you compare it to things to industries like banking, you realize there's an incredible opportunity here for digital technologies to improve the patient experience um, and efficiency of, of healthcare for both the practice as well as for patients. Um, and you know, one thing that I think is coming in the future is um, prescribing, in quotes, of digital applications. So we're starting to see the rise. There's, there's about 300,000 apps available for patients to download um, in the iOS and Android app stores. A small fraction of those have actually been validated and actually have real evidence behind them to use them. For instance, there are some apps out there that um, help diabetics it's, uh, there's, that adhere to the diabetes prevention program. And there's some good data showing that those are effective. So as a doctor, how do I tell my patients about these digital tools? Tools. And there are, there are starting to become some companies and products that allow clinicians to electronically prescribe digital tools for their patients. And that's what's being shown here. I can search for a digital intervention, like this digital diabetes prevention app, um, order it for my patient, sign it just like I would sign an electronically sign it, just like I would sign a prescription. And then that gets transferred to the patient either through their um, patient portal um, or that could be sent to them over a text message. But the, the neat thing here is, um, because I know which patient is getting the app, um, when the patient starts to use the app, and if they record any data in the app, this tool allows that data to feed back into the electronic health record so that the clinician and the clinical care team can start to see, did the patient use the diabetes prevention program app? What are their blood sugars? And start to see all of that information and be able to um, use that in the care of the patient. Another cool application is, just to give you a sense of where this is going, 
prescribing Amazon shopping lists to patients. So now imagine that you're going for a surgical procedure like a knee replacement, and after the knee replacement, we know you need certain supplies, some bandages, some tape, maybe an ACE wrap, um, and instead of writing a list or telling you, or frankly not telling you, what if we prescribed to you a shopping list that came to your email at, with Amazon, you would click on it, had all the things that we think you need, and with one click in Amazon, you could then pay for it and have that delivered to your house. Um, so this is um, some of the ways that I think digital is going to transform um, healthcare. And in order to power this, we need data behind it. Um, and getting data can be challenging, particularly for startups um, and other companies outside of healthcare. Um, one advancement that's truly improving interoperability of healthcare data is something called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And this is really um, an application programming interface, a fancy way, a standard fancy way of exchanging information between two software programs. This is the way modern software programs communicate with each other. So Facebook, Google, this is how they integrate and share data with other electronic applications. And so now imagine we define a standard application programming interface layer right in the middle, FHIR, for all of healthcare data elements. And then imagine that our electronic health record vendors agree to support that standard um, data format and that standard application programming <coughs> interface. Well, um, according to work done by um, Ken Mandel and Zach Kahani at Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School, then you can imagine a world where you could build apps. Those could be apps that run in web browsers, on smartphones, um, or on smart watches or other devices that make one call to the Fire API and can work seamlessly across different versions of electronic health record systems. So you might say, this is a good vision, it sounds good for academics, but why would any of these electronic health record companies that are competitors of each other, why would they agree to participate in FHIR and open up and share the data? Well, the answer is because they have to, because policy that started way back with um, meaningful use um, has been extended in the 21st Century Cures um, Act, and now there's about to be um, an update released any day now um, that is requiring health systems that receive Medicare or Medicaid payments to make available a standardized API, application programming interface, for patients so that patients can authorize the use of those APIs for other applications. So just to show you what that means, um, is anybody using Apple and their iPhone to retrieve their electronic health records? <coughs> anybody? One? OK, two? Um, no, that's, that's appropriate. Not a lot of folks know about this yet. So that's about the, now you're about average compared to uh, other groups that, that answered that question. Um, but Apple now has the ability in, built in natively to the, the, the most recent iOS operating systems. You can go into health records on the iPhone, and you can connect it to the hospitals or ambulatory practices that you're seeing. And you use this API. You authorize it with your credentials for the patient portal. And then Apple's using that API that I just talked about to take that data and put it onto your smartphone. And then Apple has an interface, which you're seeing here, where you're basically combining data Data from, you can combine data from multiple hospitals or clinics, and it allows you to view your healthcare data. Apple also offers an API so that third-party developers can start to build apps taking advantage of this data, um, which is really exciting. But as you can imagine, um, this data is becoming more widely available for patients to use, which is really exciting. Data is also, lots of data is also required for machine learning algorithms. And it starts to raise real questions, significant questions about data privacy. So I'm going to turn it back to Sarah to help answer those questions. Yeah, so um, the Health Insurance Portability and Account uh, Accountability Act we heard about today this morning already, HIPAA, the privacy rule, is really the key federal uh, law to protect health data privacy. And so under the HIPAA privacy rule, um, patients have generally the right to access their personal data and the electronic health records. So many healthcare systems streamline the process by providing patients with internet-based portals. So for example, uh, through the Open Notes platform or similar platforms, in which uh, patients can see their own medical records. 
And um, also the FDA has issued non-binding guidance in 2017 indicating general support for manufacturers sharing patient-specific information for medical devices with patients at their request. And as FDA correctly points out in this guidance, uh, such information really may assist patients in being more engaged with their healthcare providers in making sound medical uh, decisions. But um, as my colleagues uh, Nicholson Price and Professor Glenn Cohen uh, illustrated very nicely in this figure, uh, HIPAA has really significant gaps when it comes to today's two healthcare environments. It only covers specific health information generated by covered entities or their business associates. So in particular, the definition of covered entities uh, limits HIPAA scope. So in general, it only includes insurance companies, insurance services, insurance organizations, healthcare clearing houses and health care providers, but really not much beyond that. And so, uh, in particular, much of the health information collected by technology giants such as Amazon, Google, IBM, Facebook, and Apple, they are all investing heavily currently in the field of AI in healthcare, are not covered entities and will fall outside of the HIPAA regime. And so HIPAA also does not apply to non-health information that supports uh, inference about health, such as the purchase of a, a pregnancy test on Amazon. And moreover, HIPAA also does not um, apply in cases of user-generated health information. So for example, a Facebook post about a disease falls outside of HIPAA's regime. And these are only some reasons why uh, a lot of people think that HIPAA uh, is considered by many uh, really out of date. And um, however, while HIPAA preempts less protective state law, it does not preempt states um, who laws are more protective. And so as we heard this morning already, um, the, inspired by the EU General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, the, uh, California has recently um, taken action at the state level. And so on June 28, 2018, the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2019 was passed, and the CCPA will be operative from January 2020. And as amended, the CCPA will grant various rights to California residents with regard to personal information that is held by businesses. And the term business generally applies to a business that collects consumer personal information that does business in the state of California and that satisfies one or more of the following thresholds. So A, has annual gross revenues in excess of $25 million, or B, alone or in combination, annually buys, receives for the business commercial purposes, sells, or shares for commercial purposes, alone or in combination, the personal information of 50,000 or more consumers, households, or devices, or, or C, derives 50% or more of its annual revenues from selling consumers' personal information. And so personal information is defined here very broadly as information that identifies, relates to, describes, is capable of being associated with, or could reasonably be linked directly or indirectly with a particular consumer or a household, uh, such as, for example, a real name, the social security number, postal address, um, and biometric information. And the CCPA will not apply to protected health information that is collected by HIPAA um, covered entities or business associate, but it will apply to a great deal of information that um, are so-called shadow health records. So this is health data which is collected outside of the health system. And uh, while it's too early to tell, uh, the law has not gone into effect, uh, and some of its provision um, are in need of judicial and administrative interpretation, the CCPA is really a welcome attempt to at least partially fill in gaps and improve the data protection of individuals. And there are also further legal movements in the US at state level. So for example, a new consumer data privacy bill has been introduced in Massachusetts, and this bill has been inspired by the CCPA and also the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. And in particular, it introduces a provision, which is very interesting, that in the case of a violation of this bill, consumers do not need to demonstrate or have suffered monetary or property losses in order to seek damages for an alleged violation. So a consumer who prevails in such a lawsuit uh, shall be entitled to damages in an amount um, not greater than $750 per consumer, as well as reasonable attorney fees and costs. And if this bill uh, is enacted, it would take effect in January 2023. 
And there are also various um, other bills that have been introduced in the US Congress, such as the American Data Dissemination <coughs> Act of 2019, the Social Media Privacy Protection and Consumer Rights Act of 2019, the Data Privacy Act, the Genetic Information Privacy Act of 2019, the Privacy Bill of Rights Act, the Protected Privacy in Our Homes Act, and the Online Privacy Act of 2019. And although the privacy discussion here in the US has picking up speed, it's really still a long way to go. And I personally believe that in the US, the US would benefit from a federal law on data protection that supersedes states' uh, privacy regulations. And with that, we thank you for your attention. So uh, everyone who would like to ask a question, please feel free to come on up. And I might just start with one question, which is really an issue that um, is you know, sort of interest and concern, which is with artificial intelligence and all the algorithms, um, the concern is the liability around knowing something several years beforehand, predictive medicine, and what do we do about the physician patient relationship? Does the physician acknowledge to the patient that this algorithm is predicting something in the next few years? What are the ethics around that and what is the liability around that? That's a sort of open question. So, Yeah, so these are all very important uh, questions, especially the question also of informed consent. Uh, we haven't discussed that uh, a lot uh, in the literature and also in the in the public space yet. I think it's uh, one obvious um, um, thing we need to think of is whether um, we need a specific informed consent um, uh, for um, for those devices or if, if AI is just another technology um, and it, we don't need an, another explicit informed consent. So there are like ethical questions around that um, and also the questions of liability. Like I said, it's that what we is uh, we did in in our Gemma piece is just like a really small piece of a larger ecosystem. We don't know how it will play out. There are so many uh, different layers of liability, and probably we need to uh, wait until we also get the first uh, case in court. Yeah. Adam, maybe maybe, you maybe I'll add my clinical perspective, <laughs> yeah. and hopefully I will not be the first case in court. Um, <laughs> That's my worst nightmare. But, um, but what I would argue is um, I'll bring up a topic of information overload which I'm, uh, and alert fatigue, which I'm really worried about, which is um, already we have lots of clinical decision support in our electronic health records. And those are not necessarily AI, true AI at the top of the spectrum, but they're more rule-based. So we fire off um, drug, 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 drug interactions, drug allergy interactions, and the clinician, as they go about their day, are inundated with alerts. And so one fear I have is with AI, and you're seeing you can just give it a data set and, and start asking questions, you can have AI predicting lots of things, and you can now start putting up more and more alerts in front of our clinicians. And un unfortunately, most of those alerts get ignored. Um, and so um, I guess what I would advocate for is that we really think carefully about um, what AI we're designing, think whether or not there's an actual clinical need and use case for it, um, and then think about what's the best way to deliver the results. Um, should it be a pop-up? Should it be um, a message that, uh, that, that gets reviewed every couple of months or, um, or just once a year? Um, and, uh, and, and, then, and then monitor, another piece to this is monitor that those alerts are actually being um, reviewed and interpreted um, correctly. Um, so those are some of the ways I would, I would sort of think to, to more practically address some of those questions you're raising. Why don't we take a question from the audience? Sure. Uh, so the, the background for this is that there's also a lot of questioning in the patent world about um, whether uh, AI systems can obtain patents and uh, how you attribute inventorship in a case where uh, some kind of algorithm has actually constructed something new. To me, that always seemed like the answer should be easy, i.e. that the person who made the AI system was the inventor of this thing. But that leads me to a question about liability. Who is liable when the 
uh, algorithm actually does become the standard of care? Does that mean that the algorithm developer uh, gets the liability when there's a problem? And if so, that means that it's a crushing amount of potential liability for an algorithm developer, which seems like it would be a bit of a disincentive. Um, or is there sort of a diffusion of responsibility so that no one is actually liable in that event? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Like I said, it's like a uh, uh, we have a big eco ecosystem. We need to see how it plays out. Um, so far, one can say that like courts were very reluctant, for example, to uh, take the road of product liability and strict liability for manufacturers because they uh, judged those products as uh, like clinical su uh, decision support software, which actually helps a, clin a clinician to use those as a tool, a confirmatory tool, as a, a support tool. And that's why it was always more in uh, went the way of medical uh, malpractice. Um, so this is something uh, we will see in the future, whether it changes because we have an AI which is black box, uses uh, uh, neural networks, etc. And so probably the question is, is like uh, the physician still the captain of the ship or does this change? So that's something we need to watch out in the future. And probably it can also be, like I said, that someday probably we get regulations similar to uh, um, what we currently do with vaccines, that we have like a fund where everyone is paying in. <coughs> I might just make one comment on that. There's already been, I don't know if it's actually a legal case, but uh, a woman of color did approach the issue of whether the algorithm that was developed uh, for, I think it was breast cancer screening, some, some element like that, and whether or not that developer used data from across the board with uh, taking into account race. Mm -hmm. So it's, the issue has come up. Mm -hmm. My question may be an extension of that. If you look at how we practice medicine uh, in the realm of heuristics and guidelines, typically this is developed in a in a medical science kind of way as an open uh, exploration of data, an open presentation of the rationale for what results. If um, AI is driven by trade secret and presented as a black box, you know, does that run counter to what medicine is trying to even, how does that affect you know, the whole question of liability, the ability to trust it, what our patients can think about what we're doing? Um, so I, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, an important question. I think there are some, certainly in the academic worlds, some journals are starting to require that uh, as you publish on your algorithms that you actually publish your data set as well. And that way we can get some reproducibility um, and some insights into how this is all working. I don't know, um, I don't know if that's going to really get traction, um, but, it is, but it is starting, and I think there's a little bit of a movement forming around it, and some very prestigious journals are, are actually requiring that. So that may be one way um, to help with this so that it doesn't truly become entirely a, a black box, um, and especially in medicine where we want to replicate things, and we often see in clinical trials um, divergent results um, when, we try to, when we try to replicate. And so I think that's a really important part about medicine, um, as we need to do multiple studies um, to tend to get to uh, get to the, the current state truth. Yeah, so I also think like one should encourage like the community or the developers of AI to just try to publish more in, in peer-reviewed journals to just make sure uh, um, that um, the data sets also that they are using are uh, as good as possible and unbiased. It's very difficult because we also have unconscious bias, So, but to at least try to start with a product which is like already um, has a good uh, robust ground to then, uh, uh, because then we get the other problems like Adam already mentioned. Um, it's just one, one start to have like a good product, but the other one is also the application and the use. Is it really like, um, how do you implement those um, products then in, in the clinics? And then another big challenge, as I said, is um, um, uh, when, when those products um, are 
adaptive and they can learn over time that we make sure that we continuously monitor those products to be safe and, and stay safe and effective because the world is uh, not static. And so um, that's also another big challenge. But if we already start with a product from the beginning, which uh, does not fit any requirements and any uh, safety and effectiveness standards, then uh, we, uh, we will uh, fail in the long term. Are there any other audience questions? We're almost out of time, so you the last word right now. Well, uh, first, I'm going to come back to that question that I asked, because it's not answered yet, which is, as we predict uh, through AI and are able to tell a patient that they're going to have a disease state, what is our responsibility, and what do we do with the patient, and what does the patient do with this knowledge? I know we can't answer that today, but I think that is going to be a question that, that we have to address as we know more um, when and how do we act. It's my... No, it's, it's profound. And the only other comment I would add is we can look to genomics. So there are um, right now genomics um, uh, testing going on. We often consent the patients for this, for this, partic for this exact reason. So for instance, you can get a test um, for Huntington's disease, um, and we unfortunately don't have a treatment for that. And so the patient really needs to decide, do they want to be tested for that and know ahead of time? And it's unfortunately a very devastating disease. And so um, I think we might be able to look to genomics That's for some guidance point. on this, though they have not figured out the answers um, either. Sarah? Perfect. I just closed the session because we are running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.